Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Anderson. I'm thrilled we have one of Illinois' own. It's Ted Sanders with his first book for middle grade readers. It's called The Keepers, The Box and the Dragonfly. Welcome back to Anderson's in Naperville. Thanks. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we're excited because the book is finally out, The Keeper. It's out. It's out yeah. because when you were here last, it was for a pre-publication yeah. event. Yeah. We did out at our warehouse. And I forget how many kids we had, but we had a great group of kids and educators there. Mm -hmm. And it was back in January. So we're talking a few months, yeah. about two months before the book was officially released. So, so what was that like to have kids read the book and, and to hear their comments for the first time? And yeah. and to hear what teachers were thinking because I'm sure you you know you were nervous about what how kids reaction would be to this book when it comes out. Yeah, I still am. <laughs> no, no, you have no worries there, really. <laughs> um, it was amazing. Yeah, I I've been telling people I had. Well, just when I walked because I walked in and it was my very first thing. I mean, I've done events for other things before, but oh, this yeah, was the first right. thing for the kids yeah. book. And I saw and I walked in. And I didn't know who was in charge, so I'm walking in. There's kids all around, and I'm looking for the grown-ups, you know, <laughs> to tell me what to do. And there's a girl standing in front of me who's uh, probably 11 or 12 years old. And so I walk in. She's standing in front of me, and she literally did this. She turned around and saw me and went, oh, "You're Ted Sanders." <laughs> And I was like, whoa, that's really, that's the first time in my life oh, a stranger's so ever recognized me. But yeah, the kids, I was shocked at how tiny the kids were, you know. There were third graders, fourth graders who had right. read the book and loved it. And, you know, we did a, a, I walked around, talked to them, sat with them, and, and we did a, like a question and answer. And they were asking great questions. And so, yeah, it was kind of, kind of mind-blowing, actually, to have yeah. people, kids, yeah. reading the book and, like, smartly yeah. responding to it and being into it. It was yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sure it gave you a lot, a good feeling, knowing going forth when the book was officially out in the world that it's, you know, it did. a good reaction. Yeah, it did. And you guys did that really great thing where you had the kids sign a copy of yeah. the book, so I got yeah. to take that home and see all their right, comments, right. and they yeah. were so funny. One girl had written all over a page. She had written, "You are extravagant." <laughs> I love this book. So yeah, it was it was encouraging. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. so great. So now that the book is officially out, and it's yeah. only been about what. 10 days or so uh, since the yeah, official release, yeah. and you've, you've done some school events. Mm -hmm. So how is it feeling now? You, know, you had that, that great burst at the beginning in January before the book was out, but how does it feel now? What are you hearing, you know, reviews? And I know you got a nice Kirkus review there yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. Good. I mean, I think I'm naturally, to be honest, I think I'm naturally a little pessimistic. So I tend to think, like, it's not going well. In fact, I had a horrible nightmare before the book came out that, like, I was get, I, I had a nightmare that I got a phone call from somebody at Harper, and it was a man, which doesn't, because, I mean, the, all the higher up, everybody <laughs> at Harper, you know, it's it's all women. So just getting a call from a man was weird enough. This is in my dream. Yeah, right. And they were telling me that everything was going terribly, and 1.1% something, and we're pulling the book, and they were going to make me return even all of my copies, and they were going to, like, burn them or something. So I had this, like, weird nightmare. So I tend to be naturally pessimistic, but, like, when I go to the schools and talk to the kids, and, you know, I do, a, one in my presentations, I do a little science, some science experiments, and, you know, I show them some of the stuff from my real life that inspired the book, and the, and the kids' responses are... Great. And the, what I really love is I've seen a lot of fan art. So kids who've read the book, you know, they've made posters or they've done, you know, little, uh, they've, I went to one school and they made a little box with a dragonfly oh, in it and they'd cool. drawn a picture inside that was a scene from the book. So seeing that and seeing kids respond to the book the way that I, sure. well, remember responding to books as a kid and still respond to books, I think, is, uh, it's just the best. I yeah. love it. Oh, I love fantastic. it. Fantastic. So, you know, you talk about, you know, where the kids ask you your inspiration. So, so where, yeah. did the, where did the seeds start to grow? It was the box. So, okay. so you, know, in the, you know, there's these objects in the book that, that different keepers bond to right. and they give them different powers. And the main one is Horace. And yeah. he has his box, the box of promises. And I had the idea for that box for years. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think literally years. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I uh, originally was writing literary stuff, literary short right. fiction. You sure. know, I have the, the short story collection right. that's out. And, and at one point I even tried, I, I was working in a restaurant with a guy who was, um, he had some mental, he was mentally disabled and he also had, um, uh, he also had some gender issues that he was trying to work out at the same time and he was just this really strange kind of character. And at one point I was trying to write a short story where he had the box, box. and oh, it just yeah. was a disaster yeah. and it didn't work at all and I was like, 
where, how am I going to make that happen? And then one day it sort of happened real quickly. I yeah. had this like sort of inspiration for, oh, there's all kinds of these objects, and the, and it's a kids' book. You know, I'd always wanted to write yeah. a kids' book, and right. the the idea for the book unfolded in in like for the whole series, yeah. unfolded in like a day. But it was that box. It all started with the box, wow. and then Horace, and then the other okay. characters came yeah. after. So, so decided because you know you have published a you know adult collection of stories. Mm -hmm. You know, this one this won some great prizes. But why kids? What what made you want to write yeah. for kids? And and middle grade, you know, those kids that yeah. are right in the middle, you know, the ones, you know, they're not young adults yet, no. but, yeah. but they're still in that fourth, fifth, sixth grade level. They're yeah. really interesting. Oh, yeah. Aren't they? Yeah, they're like the best. Sure. Um, yeah. A couple things. I, went, I had worked in an independent bookstore in Champaign, right. Pages for All Ages. Yay. Oh, yeah, I know, it's gone. gone. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. sad part. Yeah. But, it was, right. but it was great and it was formative for me. I worked in the children's department. I worked there for seven or eight years um, and I worked in the children's department eventually became a buyer for the children's department and you know worked with kids a lot and uh, and this was before I started writing so I mean I'd written as a kid right, but this was in my right. 20s when I'd sort of stopped writing because I didn't really wasn't happy with anything I was writing didn't know where I was going to go so um, it, it, in, uh, in fact I had an interviewer ask me the other day you know um, what is it like to shift you know it's sort of weird isn't it writing literary fiction right. for adults and then shifting to kids and to me it feels more like it was weird that i wrote literary stuff oh that's so First, interesting yeah, yeah. and the, you know it's more that you know the ki writing kids books right. feels like what i should have been doing all along yeah. i love it it's great so i think a lot of it was working at the bookstore also i had my son and my stepdaughter were sure. 10 13 right. uh, around right. that age when i was starting to write it so i was watching them and uh yeah, and I read a lot of middle grade fiction. Right, That's, okay. I love to read it. So you think you'll ever go back to the, the adult, more literary? Uh, maybe. You know, every once in a while I have sort of the itch to do yeah. that. I don't have the time well, yeah. when I do yeah. have the itch. Sure, um, sure. But I, I don't know. I don't think so. I like this so much more. It's just more fun. Writing with literary stuff feels like work. Like, yeah. you know, it feels like chiseling away and I don't know. Writing the kids' books feels like playing outside. Yeah. Or, you know, well, it's just more fun. Well, but that's the way we're reacting as readers and kids react as readers because yeah. they want to play too. Yeah. I, and, I'm, yeah. and I am a child. I mean, if you go to my house and look around, you will be <laughs> like, why do you have all these toys? So Horace. Horace F. Horace. Andrews, you know, and he's on the bus. He's riding home from school and he sees his name on a sign. I love the beginning of this book. Oh, thanks. Because it, it, it has that magic already starting, you know. Right and, and But... You know, it has, and I love the sign you do. State your name. State, state your state your name. State. State your, your name, name. Your state. state. Your name. name. Your yeah. So state. it's circular. Yeah, so it's round. you could, and it's. I love the way he answers when he goes. You know, when he finally comes back, and he he goes into this dark alley because there, there's so many things that remind you of other wonderful stories that you're just waiting for something to happen. But I love the way you use language in this book and some of the quotes and the vocabulary is just wonderful. I think uh -huh. for a middle grade reader, it makes it so rich. So was that something that you crafted or was that, that just sort of came? Because I know, you know, you, you teach at the university level, you teach creative writing, and this is what you've done, you know, with, with writing adult, you know, literary fiction. So, so language how, how do you craft that into a story like this i've always been really fascinated with words um, one of my and maybe my favorite kids books is uh the westing game uh, you know yeah. i was so obsessed with that and all the on all sure. of her books all those puzzle mystery books that right, that right. ellen raskin has yeah. um and I and I love I love games and I love words and so I think a lot of that word play. I mean I'm very aware that that the Westing game in particular was yeah. formative for me in terms of thinking about how you can have this sort of puzzle and words having more than one meaning and and the mystery of just what what does that mean you know and right. I want to get to the to the bottom of that word so um, and I love games I mean right. I, I play video games but we also play a lot of board games at home and so I'm always just fascinated with how words can be kind of dug into and how you can make them seem this way but then if you look yeah. at them in a slightly different direction, it means something yeah, entirely right. different, you know. Yeah. Um, and I love to know what words mean. I'm always trying to get to, when I talk to kids, I'm like, oh, there's this word. And, you know, you can think about it this way and it helps you understand what that yeah. word actually means. Yeah. I, I really love language. It's so so awesome. Horace being curious, mm -hmm. how much is, of Horace is you? It's funny because when I was talking to <laughs> when I've been talking to kids, I've been showing them a picture of my son who was 13 when I started writing okay. the, the books. And I... And I say that there's a lot of uh, my son and Horace, which is true. My ah. son's quiet. And then, but then later on, I, I, as I was doing these talks, I realized that there's probably more me and Horace than uh. my and my son. Um, 
Yeah, I'm very curious about the world. I'm the kind of guy who, like, when I'm driving down the highway, I'll be like, man, how big a truck did they need to bring out all these cones? Or, you know, how many bolts are on these signs, right? These you drive in. Well, yeah, it's that, those it, questions, yeah. always having those questions. I'm, always, I'm yeah. super curious about the world, and I'm always doing things to try to figure out how something works yeah. and understand. And right. I... To, a, to the point where I think I drive my family a little nuts. I'm like, what do you, how, how do you think, why is that tree there? Why did they leave that tree? And they're like, oh my God, nobody cares. I'm like, but there's a weird tree there all by itself, you know? Yeah, I'm just yeah, a curious guy, yeah, and that's yeah. that's for sure. And Chloe, the, the girl he, he mm -hmm. meets when he goes under, under now, yeah. the, you know. Chloe, is she based on anybody? Because she's such a, she's such a fun character, too. She's my favorite character. She, I'm uh, glad you said okay. that, because I love her to yeah. death. I just no. think she's so... Awesome. I, and, uh, you know, I feel like I know her. Like, I'm not like. Yeah. You know, when you're a writer, you don't feel like you made them. You just feel like you're getting right, to know sure. them, you yeah, know? So right, right. I'm really happy to know her. Yeah. She's re I think she's really funny and and loyal. Uh, it, it's it, it's interesting because I, I think more than any other character in the book, she's not really based on anybody. Yeah. And I don't know really where that came from. Mm -hmm. She's There are little parts of her that are based on. Um, I've got a couple little cousins that are 10 and 12. And. And they're spitfires, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. But they're not like Chloe in that they're much more chaotic. You know, okay. Chloe's very okay. controlled. You know, she's 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 wild, but on her own terms completely right. all the time. Um, yeah. And I think the other thing that makes her really appealing for me is that she is is Horace. I mean, the two of them together make an awesome pair because she's so loyal, you know, and she's she very quickly, doesn't really tw trust anybody, but mm -hmm. she very quickly decides that she would do basically anything yeah, for Horace. Yeah. And that just makes me Oh, and they, it's such a great, yeah, the friendship they have. So so the world of the Keepers and, and knowing, you know, you set this in Chicago. So, yeah, which is, I did. So what, where did you grow up exactly? I grew up in Illinois. I grew up in McHenry. McHenry, that's Illinois, right. You told yeah. me that before. So growing up McHenry and going in Chicago and seeing everything. Mm -hmm. So studying in Chicago, I think, makes it so much fun for Illinois kids reading yeah, this Yeah, I book. hope so. But also, too, so tell us a little bit about the world of the Keepers, what what we don't know what lies underneath and what Horace discovers. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so as you know, he gets into the, the House of Answers right. and he starts to realize that there are all these um, magical, I'm going to use that word, I don't know if it's totally right for the book, and that's one of the things about the book is what's magical. What does magical mean? Right, right, um, right. And uh, and yeah, he's, he discovers that there are all these objects out there, these tanji, these these magical objects, and that they're all bonded to these different keepers, and each right. one has a different instrument, a different tanji with a different power. And um, the big thing that he ends up discovering is that there's this this basically this secret centuries-long war that's been going on over these prized collections of, of, of Tanji. Um, and I really wanted to have that sense. And it's hard to do, but I, I, I had somebody ask me the other day, why didn't you just go like, fan and like make up a world? You know, yeah. a high well, fantasy kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Um, and I said, well, I, I don't think that's as interesting. I, mean, I think it's more interesting, to a kid especially, I think right. it's more interesting to imagine, I mean, I remember being a kid and watching like In Search Of and yeah. stuff like that, oh, you know, and, oh, sure. right, and yeah. sure, just being fascinated. Yeah. But you know, you see all this stuff, and then you're like, but just around that corner, just under that thing, just down those stairs, there's something that's yeah. like going to blow your mind. Right. And, and that extra layer of, you know, it's right there. And yeah. I could just, if I could just get in there, yeah. you know, if I could be one well, of the secret the members. it's the mystery and just that, you know, yeah. that curiosity and that itch to know, you know. Yeah. And I think that's what this book is all about, is, is wanting is. to know what it is. And I think for, and that's what keeps, it's so plot driven and so character driven. And they're just, the characters are so fantastic in the plot mm. that I think kids will, will in adding the mystery to it, then you've got all the best, you know. Oh, oh that's yeah. nice you to say. I no, hope so. No, and, and, and the genre, I think it's kind of hard to put this into a particular genre. You know, we can call this a yeah. urban, some people urban fantasy, right. throw in some little physics, and you know, you've got, <laughs> yeah. but the, the mystery part of it, I think, is the what really attracts kids to this, too. It, it is, yeah, and it's a fine line for me, because I realized, I mean, one of the driving forces for me was getting to that mode where I could say, uh, yeah, there's this mystery, there's this magic going on, but... I always was frustrated in reading books. I'm like, yeah, there's magic, but what? How does that work? What does that mean? How do how do you right. how does that how do you do that? What's yeah. actually happening? And so I really loved the idea of being able to see. Okay, I've got this magic thing, but I'm going to think about how it actually works in the right. physical world, like right. according to the right. laws of the universe. Arthur C. Clarke has that famous quote. 
uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I thought that's so interesting. Yeah. And, and yeah. But then I realized that if you take that too far, then, you, then you, you do, it becomes science fiction. And that's one of the roles that Chloe plays, right. is Horace really wants to know how stuff works. Sure. And there's a scene where Chloe explicitly says, I do not want to know. Do right. not bug me well, with the science. But she has a power because she can, you know, yes. disappear and reappear. And all right, exactly. Yeah, right. She's like, do not, yeah, do right. not bug me with that. <laughs> yes, it's right. just, it's just magic, and it just yeah. works because I know how it works, and I make it happen. And <laughs> the host is like, well, but I think it might be the particles and the molecules, and and she's like, no. Nope. But so, so that's so cool, the logical and the, you know, yeah. integrate that that. Well, because I, I really like the logical side. Yeah, of it, but right. if you go too yeah. far down that road, then all of a sudden, <laughs> some of the mystery starts to. Right. Slide right. away. Yeah. But then you got to have the bad guys. You know, you got to have the ribbon. You know, and then right. Dr. Jericho, and you know, he's kind of an insect creepy kind of woo woo kind yeah. of creepy. And they live in nests, so the nest part kind of ooh and all, mm. ooh, all of it. But they're the you know the sh these sh they live in the shadows. So tell us about where where the ribbon came from. You know. <laughs> yeah. In this I, it, it's. Um, I don't want to give away too much about yeah, what happened. No, we don't want to spoilers. Yeah. We have to be careful here. Uh, <laughs> but I knew that I had to have this sort of a, a, a race of beings, these these sort of shadowy figures that um, basically claim all these instruments for themselves. So their right. storyline for themselves is, these are ours, right. and you people, you, Horace, Chloe, the other keepers, the other human keepers, they're like, you, you have no business right. uh, having these things. Um, and so that's this this kind of dynamic, uh, it's this weird, there's sort of a clubbishness already, I think, to, to becoming one of the keepers. Uh, right. You know, Horace, you know, you enter into that secret society, and then you realize that but there's this whole other secret society that you're kind of a part of, because you're a keeper, and you have mm -hmm. these tanji, but then there's these bad guys that say, no, we have the tanji, yeah. and there's this... I mean, there's almost a little sort of um, a class thing going on you know, right in the in the beginning of the book. Um, you know, Dr. Jericho, like the right. big bad guy, yeah. so yeah. calls Horace a tinker, and it turns out that that you learn later that that's sort of a slur. Yeah. On, you know, for his kind, he it's it's a it's a derogatory term yeah. for what Horace is. You yeah. know, that he has no business being a keeper whatsoever. Yeah, right. Yeah, they're out to just well we don't want to get into too much it's going to happen so so the, the vocabulary you created you know to to call certain things um mm, yeah like the tanji you know like where where did those words come from because i love the glossary you put in the back oh you do oh, oh it's good. really helpful and i think kids I will glossaries. really love that i do too i love yeah. having and if i want to refer to something or i can't remember what that is i love having glossaries when when there's words that you're not familiar with so okay so my very yeah. favorite book in the world is watership down oh and Watership Down has a glossary yeah. of all the well, rabbit yeah. words. Yeah. It's got all the rabbit l l lingo, lingo yeah. in there. Yeah. Um, so I wanted a glossary. <laughs> and I don't know that my editor would have chosen that on her own, but oh, I was like, I really want yeah, a glossary because, yeah. you know, because yeah. it's there if you want it. Yeah. It's there if you need it. And I think it's yeah. fun to look through it. Yeah. The words themselves, um, there is actually, I mean, if you go into my huge document of notes I have on the series, I actually mm -hmm. do have a little glossary put together, or a little sort of etymology of different words. So some of the words you can actually see, like there's the tanji, and it's T-A-N-J-I, and there's also later on you get these sort of personalized crystal right. things that yeah. the keepers do called jathandras, and the J-I in tanji is the same as the J-I in jathandra, and it sort of yeah. means self. So there's a little, and actually in my head anyway, there is a little sort of, well, I mean it's not like Tolkien or anything, but there's a but little, little bit, bit of, of language creation. There is, yeah, a little, right, a very yeah, little bit, yeah, but right, yeah, it's, yeah, sometimes yeah. I just make up a word because I just think it sounds cool. Well, yeah, well, well <laughs> yeah. kids do too though, yeah. Yeah. I mean this time. Yeah. So, so, you know, the, I think, you know, when you talk about fantasy or science fiction or whatever, you know, I think this is a multitude of, of, of kind of genres thrown into one. Um, but that world building where, you know, you have to have certain rules because you do. Yeah. You, have, you have these creatures that also, we can talk about those, you know, the golem and the different creatures down there. So you have to have certain rules. Do you keep sort of like a little rule book because this is going to be a four book series, right? Right. So do you have to keep some of those rules and know, you know, that, okay, this is this is only what they can do, or so far, you know, this is the rules. Oh, completely, it, yeah. and it is uh, so much so that it's the biggest, it's the biggest headache in writing okay. the series. Okay. Yeah, and, and I don't know how somebody like a Robert Jordan or whoever keeps track of their world. Yeah. I, I, I totally have lots of rules, I have to write them down, and, and it's complicated by the fact because uh, uh, of editing, so I'll write a, I'll write a version, and then later we'll either I'll tweak it, or in the editing process with my editor we'll tweak it, and I realize that one thing that somebody said they could do or couldn't do will change it. Uh, even just yeah. a little thing like this. So, 
one of the uh, one of the characters has a tanji that has sort of an area of effect. Gabriel, he has sort of an area of an effect thing. It, you know, it, it takes place over a certain range. And in book one, uh, he says something like, "I can spread it about 40 feet." And then I was writing a scene in book two, and and I realized that I was writing a scene where I needed it to be bigger than 40 feet. And so I had to go into my notes and change it to a, to 80. And I had to, I had to call my editor and <laughs> say, "Can we were late in the process?" Oh but book God. one, I was like, "Can we change that to 80?" And we changed it to 80. Yeah. So I'm doing stuff like that all the time oh, yeah. because it's because you have to have the rules. Got, yeah, you got to follow yeah. it. So and I am so sure so that I just... have broken some of them accidentally. Well, the kids, kids will, will catch find you. out. They will catch you. They are. Yeah, I try my hardest, but I'm sure I haven't done it 100 percent. So all the creatures, you know, the creatures, well, the golem and, well, and then, you know, the, these monsters are the, and I love the dogs, you know, the, uh, oh, the, the crucible dogs. Yeah, the cru yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, where are these coming from? What depth of your, <laughs> your imagination? Well, great, um, yeah, with the, go with the golem, I wanted to, um, it was, um, uh, one of the things I want to do is I have this idea because it is uh, like an urban fantasy. Right, you know, it's beneath right. the surface of the real world. I like this notion that some of these creations, some of these tanji, these these tanu, is, is like sort of the umbrella term for all these magical objects, yeah. um, might be recognizable to us in our own folklore, in our own stories. Right. So, the, so the golem is actually one of those where. Uh, oh, that's yeah. The, so this is like the vert. So the golem is actually a, he's. It's not a creature. It's it's actually an instrument, right? It's actually a device. Um, but the idea that it would bleed over into the story yeah. of what we know, because it's sort of a, you know, it's made of earth, earth and made and of many stones, and, and so it's yeah, like my right. version of that. Yeah. So a lot of it is me taking something that seems. <sighs> Well, that is a real part of our own mythologies yeah. and turning it into something that's a little off. Uh, even the, uh, you mentioned the Crucible Hound, yeah, so the, right. the Crucible itself is actually, I don't think this is, is referenced at all in the book, but I referenced it on my website. The Crucible actually is, is my version of the Hand of Glory. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. If, you, if you look at how it's described and the effect of it yeah. and the way that it's okay. described in the book, it's, it's actually yeah. stemming from that. Yeah. So a lot of those creatures come from me saying, just thinking about a real thing well, that you're you adding, imagine. But do you think kids will? Do you, do you talk about some of that when you talk to kids? So very aware that some of that, you know, the, you know. I haven't been. Yeah, I haven't but been. But that's I would, really interesting. You know, I, yeah, you know, I would like yeah. to. Uh, on the yeah. website, I think there's a little bit of that. Um, you know, I have a little page up now that describes the ribbons, some of yeah, the bad guys, right. and it and I think it digs into that a little bit. And I'm hoping that as the series goes on, I'll have more opportunities to to bring in like legendary things that we recognize and yeah. say, oh, that's. It's yeah, bringing that, that the mythology and those legends and those yeah, other things from, I mean, from other not, sources is kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. not this specifically, but like, you know, like Excalibur, right? Something like that, right? right. Um, that would actually be sort of a magical yeah, kind of thing. Sure. Yeah, So the science, tell me. Now, you teach, yeah. you teach creative writing I down do. at U of I, Champaign. You know. So what is it about physics? And, and where does that love come? And it, throwing this into this book was so brilliant. And, in, oh, and, and Horace is, you know, just wanting to know how things are put together, how matter works, how things work. So, so and, and you have a great thing on Tumblr where you have a lot of fun experiments and everything, right? Don't I you? do, yeah, I just yeah. started it, it's new, but yeah, yeah I'm hoping to add just, more oh, to that. Oh, that's so yeah. cool, though, uh, I watch yeah. it, it was I, really fun. I, well, I love it, and when I do my school presentations, we do a couple yeah. little experiments. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not really sure where that came from. I think it's just a natural offshoot of being curious, yeah. you know? I, mean, I think we tend to sort of pigeonhole science as like this thing that scientists yeah. do in a lab, but really it's something we do right. all day long all the time. We just see the world and things are curious and we wonder and sometimes we test it out, right? Kids do it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I tell a story in, in when I do my school presentations about my wife going to the refrigerator and smelling a funny smell and wondering what it is and having to smell the bacon to see if it's the bacon and this is basically the scientific process that she's using, right? She's using right, the scientific sure, sure. method to figure yeah, that out. Yeah. So for me it's just kind of a natural offshoot of being curious and yeah. I, I read a lot of science uh, you know, blogs and I go to a lot of science websites and I read magazines and, and you know, layman's books. Yeah, I don't have any right. formal training, but I'm very much an amateur yeah. science yeah. buff, you know, physics and, and biology especially. Yeah. So teachers love this. Fits right into Common Core, you know. But, uh, Not just the literature, does. but the but the science element. Yeah, of it yeah no, I think the I think yeah. the teachers have been kind of stem, surprised stem, halfway stem through. related that. education. Yeah, hey. halfway through my presentation, all of a sudden I'm like busting out the scientific method, and the teacher's like, he's talking about the scientific method yeah. in this fantasy yeah. book, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah which for me cool. is exciting. Yeah. So all of your other writing, how is that? How is that influenced? what you did with the keepers and you know in writing now that one's out and you're working on number two so how how has that influenced you and how much of those 
those adult elements do you put into the children's work? Or is it a completely different kind of process? Or is it it's a similar process yeah. in that, and I think it's good that I started off as a literary writer in part because, you know, I st when I tried to write as a teenager, it was very plot-driven. I was reading a lot of Stephen King, you know, and so I'd have, ah, oh, this scary thing's got to happen or whatever. Um, but then literary writing, of course, is much more, in general, I'm generalizing, but uh, character-driven. And so for me, in, in that way, the process is exactly the same, which is to say that, and this is something I tell my students all the time, that if you think about what plot is mm -hmm. in a book, uh, barring natural disasters, plot in a book is nothing more than characters deciding to do something. Yeah. That's plot, period. And so if you know your characters, and if you know the kinds of things that they would say, or do, or think, how they would react, how they would not react, then you just let them do their things and yeah. you have to decide it's like acting so you have to kind of inhabit them and decide on their behalf what's appropriate and what's not and the next thing you know the story's going so for me that's exactly the same i mean that's how i wrote mm -hmm. the keepers and i still do i'll sit oh, especially with the character that maybe i don't have a direct model for like horace is more like me chloe's not as much like me so for chloe i'll i'll spend an hour sitting there thinking what would she say? How would she react to that? What would she do? What kind of face would right. she make? And, and that's what drives it. So in that sense, that's very much yeah. the same. Yeah. Okay, so as a professor of yeah. creative writing, uh -huh. outline or not to outline? No, don't. Excellent answer. No, don't. <laughs> I, I never do, and I, and I, I, I know I love some that writers do. I know some I writers know. do. I mean, writers should do what works for them. I don't believe that outlining okay. works, and for that very reason. Right. Because if I'm going to say I want my character to drive the story, and then I'm going to say, but they've got to fit in this scaffolding, well, then I'm robbing them of all their agency. I'm saying to that character, no, you can't do that. You have to do what I said you were going to do. So for me, my roughest sense of outlining is I'll have a vague point that I think I want to get to, and I can imagine that the story can get that, that play, to that place. And often it does, but often it doesn't. I mean, I, if I look back now, I had an original, when I first came up with the idea for the book, I had this sort of rough sketched out of 20 chapters, and here's what happens, here's what happens. If I go back to that now, half of it did not happen at all, May, probably more than half. Sure, so no, sure. I'm not an outliner. No, I love that, because yeah. what you're experiencing, and you're, you know, we're getting that same sense of all those great senses of what happens to a well, character. You have to believe in what think, the characters well, yeah, are doing. Because it's, it's, it's spontaneous. We're, we're getting the same feeling you did when you write it. It's just, yeah. I always wonder if you can, you can type fast enough to get it into your, you know, your laptop. I <laughs> have literally walked into the room to my wife and I'll be like, you won't believe what Chloe just did. <laughs> and, she'll, and she'll be like, you're an idiot. Because yeah. you wrote yeah. that. And I'm like, yeah, but it wasn't like that. She just, she just did this cool thing. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So, foreign rights. I know they've been sold a lot. That's got to be exciting that this story will be it in is. other countries, right, it's, with other it, kids. It, it is. We yeah. so so far. It's already out in um, UK. UK, right? It came out last week. It has a really cool cover. I don't know if you've seen it, but Chris Riddell did the cover. I know. Oh, I uh, love his he's art. So no, good. I haven't seen that. Yeah, he did the cover f for the UK version, and then Brazil. So it's going to be in Portuguese. In fact, the translator just contacted me the other day, and he was right. like, "If I have questions, may I contact you?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I like." Portuguese is beautiful, yeah. um, and then Italy, and then uh, not too long ago Poland, which I'm excited about that. I don't know why I'm excited about it being in in Polish. I, I have a friend who's been learning Polish recently, and maybe that's why. Oh, that's so but cool. That's, that's really neat. Yeah, oh, yeah. to imagine Wonderful. it being in different languages. It's so interesting. And the covers decide what they decide to use for different. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, so cool. yeah. So we're in the process yeah. with all those. So to tell us what's happening with book two, when we when we hope to see that one, and then. Give us just a little bit, but no spoilers, about what could happen in, in title yeah. for book number title two. Title is The Harp and the Raven Vine. Oh. Um, all the books are going to be like that, so a couple of different instruments. Uh, yeah, book two is going to be next March, okay. March 2016. Um, I'm actually still writing it, so I'm, I'm actually a little behind right now, but um, it's mostly done. And, and I'm into it. Um, it's the Harp and the Raven Mine. We're going to get a new character. Still going to be Horace and Chloe. Horace and Chloe are our are main folks. Uh, but we're going to get a new keeper. She's the keeper of a new instrument called the Raven Vine. So, um, and I, in fact, I just saw a cover sketch the other day that looks awesome. Okay, I was cool. like, it hasn't been approved. But I was like, if this doesn't get approved, I'm going to cry. Uh, but new keeper, I will say this, not too, too much spoilery, but it has something to do with animals. Um, okay. You have to come back with number two. I will. All I'm right. excited. What a great conversation with someone who is a professor of creative writing at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. It's Ted Sanders with his new book for middle grade readers. It's called The Keepers, The Box and the Dragonfly. 
Thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed.